Chapter 18, The Stampede Trail. It is nearly impossible for modern man to imagine what it is like to live by hunting. The life of a hunter is one of hard, seemingly continuous overland travel. A life of frequent concerns that the next interception may not work, that the trap or the drive will fail, or that the herds will not appear this season. Above all, the life of a hunter carries with it the threat of deprivation and death by starvation. John M. Campbell, The Hungry Summer. Now what is history? It is the centuries of systematic explorations of the riddle of death with a view to overcoming death. That's why people discover mathematical infinity and electromagnetic waves. That's why they write symphonies. Now, you can't advance in this direction without a certain faith. You can't make such discoveries without spiritual equipments. And the basic elements of this equipment are in the Gospels. What are they? To begin with, love of one's neighbor, which is the supreme form of vital energy. Once it fills the heart of man, it has to overflow and spend itself. And then the two basic ideals of modern man. Without them, he is unthinkable. The idea of free personality and the idea of life as sacrifice. Boris Pasternak, Dr. Shivago, passage highlighted in one of the books found with Christopher McCandless's remains. After his attempt to depart the wilderness was stymied by the Teklanika's high flow, McCandless arrived back at the bus on July 8th. It's impossible to know what was going through his mind at that point, for his journal betrays nothing. Quite possibly, he was unconcerned about his escape routes having been cut off. Indeed, at the time, there was little reason for him to worry. It was the height of summer, the country was a fecund riot of plant and animal life, and his food supply was adequate. He probably surmised that if he bided his time until August, the Teklanika would subside enough to be crossed. Re-established in the corroded shell of Fairbanks 142, McCandless fell back into his routine of hunting and gathering. He read Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Illich and Michael Crichton's Terminal Man. He wrote in his journal that it rained for a week straight. Game seems to have been plentiful. In the last three weeks of July, he killed 35 squirrels, four spruce grouse, five jays and woodpeckers, and two frogs, all of which he supplemented with wild potatoes, wild rhubarb, various species of berries, and large numbers of mushrooms. But despite this apparent munificence, the meat he'd been killing was very lean, and he was consuming fewer calories than he was burning. After subsisting for three months on an exceedingly marginal diet, McCandless had run up a sizable caloric deficit. He was balanced on a precarious edge, and then, in late July, he made the mistake that pulled him down. He had just finished reading Dr. Sav Dr. Zhivago, a book that incited him to scribble excited notes in the margins and underline several passages, such as, Laura walked along the tracks, following a path worn by pilgrims, and then turned into the fields. Here she stopped, and closing her eyes, took a deep breath of the flower-scented air of the broad expanse around her. It was dearer to her than her kin, better than a lover, wiser than a book. For a moment, she rediscovered the purpose of her life. She was here on earth to grasp the meaning of its wild enchantment and to call each thing by its right name, or, if this were not within her power, to give birth out of love for life to successors who would do it in her place." Nature slash purity, he printed in bold characters at the top of the page. Another passage. Oh, how one wishes sometimes to escape from the meaningless dullness of human eloquence, from all those sublime phrases, and to take refuge in nature, apparently so inarticulate, or in the wordlessness of long grinding labor, of sound sleep, of true music, or of a human understanding rendered speechless by emotion. McCandless starred and bracketed the paragraph and circled refuse, refuge in nature in black ink. Next to, and so it turned out that only a life similar to the life of those around us, merging with it without a ripple, is genuine life, and that an unshared happiness is not happiness, and this was most vexing of all. He noted, happiness only real when shared. It is tempting to regard this latter notation as further evidence that McCandless's long, lonely sabbatical had changed him in some significant way. It can be interpreted to mean 
and that he was ready, perhaps, to shed a little of the armor he wore around his heart, that upon returning to civilization he intended to abandon the life of a solitary bag vagabond, stop running so hard from intimacy, and become a member of the human community. But we will never know, because Dr. Shivago was the last book Chris McCandless would ever read. Two days after he finished the book on July 30th, there is an ominous entry in the journal. Extremely weak. Faults of pot seed. Much trouble just to stand up. Starving. Great jeopardy. Before this note, there is nothing in the journal to suggest that McCandless was in dire circumstances. He was hungry, and his meager diet had pared his body down to a feral scrawn of gristle and bone, but he seemed to be in reasonably good health. Then, after July 30th, his physical condition suddenly went to hell. By August 19th, he was dead. There has been a lot of conjecture about what caused such a precipitous decline. In the days following the identification of McCandless's remains, Wayne Westerberg vaguely recalled that Chris might have purchased some seeds in South Dakota before heading north, including perhaps some potato seeds, with which he intended to plant a vegetable garden after getting established in the bush. According to one theory, McCandless never got around to planting the garden. I saw no evidence of a garden in the vicinity of the bus, and by late July had grown hungry enough to eat the seeds, which poisoned him. Potato seeds are, in fact, mildly toxic after they've begun to sprout. They contain, they contain solanine, a poison that occurs in plants of the nightshade family, which causes vomiting, diarrhea, headache, and lethargy in the short term and adversely affects heart rate and blood pressure when ingested over an extended period. This theory has a serious flaw, however. In order for McCandless to have been incapacitated by potato seeds, he would have had to eat many, many pounds of them, and given the light weight of his pack when Galleon dropped him off, it is extremely unlikely that he carried more than a few grams of potato seeds, if he carried any at all. But other scenarios involve potato seeds of an entirely different variety, and these scenarios are more plausible. Pages 126 and 127 of a Tanina plant lore describe a plant that is called wild potato by the Danana Indians, who harvested its carrot-like root. The plant, known as Tabotanus, as Hedicerum alpinium, grows in gravelly soil throughout the region. According to Tanana plant lore, the root of the wild potato is probably the most important food of the Danana, other than wild fruit. They eat it in a variety of ways, raw, boiled, baked, or fried, and enjoy it especially dipped in oil or lard, in which they also preserve it. The citation goes on to say that the best time to dig wild potatoes is in the spring as soon as the ground thaws. During the summer, they evidently become dry and tough. Priscilla Russell Carey, the author of Tanana Plant Lore, explained to me that spring was a really hard time for the Danana people, particularly in the past. Often the game they depended on for food didn't show up, or the fish didn't start running on time, so they depended on wild potatoes as a major staple until the fish came in late spring. It has a very sweet taste. It was, and still is, something they really like to eat. Above ground, the wild potato grows as a bushy herb two feet tall with stalks of delicate pink flowers reminiscent of miniature sweet pea blossoms. Taking a cue from Kari's book, McCandless started to dig and eat wild potato roots on June 24th, apparently without ill effect. On July 14th, he began consuming the pea-like seed pods of the plant as well, probably because the roots were becoming too tough to eat. A photograph he took during this period shows a one-gallon Ziploc plastic bag stuffed to overflowing with such seeds. And then, on July 30th, the entry in his journal reads, Extremely weak, fault of potato seed. One page after Tanana plant lore enumerates the wild potato, it describes a closely related species, wild sweet pea, Hedsarum mackenzie. Although a slightly smaller plant, wild sweet pea looks so much like wild potato that even expert botanists sometimes have trouble telling the species apart. There is only a single distinguishing characteristic that is absolutely reliable. On the underside of the wild potato's tiny green leaflets are conspicuous lateral veins. Such veins are invisible on the leaflets of the wild sweet pea. Kari's book warns that because wild sweet pea is so difficult to distinguish from wild potato and is reported to be poisonous, care should be taken to identify them accurately before attempting to use the wild potato as food. 
Accounts of individuals being poisoned from eating H. mackenzie are non-existent in modern medical literature, but the aboriginal inhabitants of the north have apparently known for millennia that wild sweet pea is toxic and remain extremely careful not to confuse H. alpinum with H. mackenzie. To find a documented poisoning attributable to wild sweet pea, I had to go all the way back to the 19th century annals of Arctic exploration. I came across what I was looking for in the journals of Sir John Richardson, a famous Scottish, Scottish surgeon, naturalist, and explorer. He'd been a member of the hapless Sir John Franklin's first two expeditions and had survived both of them. It was Richardson who executed by gunshot the suspected murderer cannibal on the first expedition. Richardson also happened to be the botanist who first wrote a scientific description of H. Mackenzie and gave the plant its botanical name. In 1848, while leading an expedition through the Canadian Arctic in search of the by then missing Franklin, Richardson made a botanical comparison of H. alpinum and H. Mackenzie. H. alpinum, he observed in his journal, furnishes long flexible roots which taste sweet like the licorice and are much eaten in the spring by the natives but become woody and lose their juiciness and crispness as the season advances the root of the hoary decumbent and less elegant but larger flowered hedicera mackenzie is poisonous and nearly killed an old indian woman at fort simpson who had mistaken it for that of the preceding species Fortunately, it proved emetic, and her stomach having rejected all that she had swallowed, she was restored to health, though her recovery was for some time doubtful. It was easy to imagine Chris McCandless making the same mistake as the Indian woman and becoming similarly incapacitated. From all the available evidence, there seemed to be little doubt that McCandless, rash and incautious by nature, had committed, committed a careless blunder, confusing one plant for another, and then died as a consequence. In the outside article, I reported with great certainty that H. Mackenzie, the wild sweet pea, killed the boy. Virtually every other journalist who wrote about the McCandless tragedy drew the same conclusion. But, as the months passed and I had the opportunity to ponder McCandless's death at greater length, this consensus came to seem less and less plausible. For three weeks, beginning on June 24th, McCandless had dug and safely eaten dozens of wild potato roots without mistaking H. McKenzie for H. alpinum. Why on July 14th, when he started gathering seeds instead of roots, would he suddenly have confused the two species? McCandless, I came to believe with increasing conviction, scrupulously steered clear of the reportedly toxic H. McKenzie and never ate its seeds or any other part of the plant. He was indeed poisoned, but the plant that killed him wasn't wild sweet pea. The agent of his demise was wild potato, H. alpinum, the species plainly identified as non-toxic in Tanana plant lore. The book advises only that the roots of the wild potato are edible. Although it says nothing about the seeds of the species being edible, it also says nothing about the seeds being toxic. Nor have the seeds of H. alpinum have ever been described as toxic in any other published text. But the pea family happens to be rife with species that produce alkaloids, chemical compounds that have powerful pharmacological effects on humans and animals. Morphine, caffeine, nicotine, curare, strychnine, and mescaline are all alkaloids. And in many alkaloid producing species, moreover, the toxin is strictly localized within the plant. What happens with a lot of legumes, explains John Bryant, a chemical ecologist at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, is that the plants concentrate alkaloids in the seed coats in late summer to discourage animals from eating their seeds. Depending on the time of year, it would not be uncommon for a plant with edible roots to have poisonous seeds. If a species does produce alkaloids as fall approaches, the seeds are where the toxin is most likely to be found. During my visit to the Shoshana River in 1993, I collected the samples of H. alpinum growing within a few feet of the bus and sent some dried seed pods from this sample to Dr. Thomas Clausen, a colleague of Professor Bryant's in the chemistry department at the University of Alaska. 
Although preliminary analysis by Clausen and a graduate student, Edward Treadwell, indicated the seeds contained traces of an alkaloid, subsequent, more thorough testing turned up no indication of any alkaloids whatsoever, toxic or otherwise. I was baffled. Given the alarming, unambiguous entry McCandless had scrawled in his journal on July 30th, I found it hard to believe that the enormous quantity of seeds he'd eaten just prior to that date played no role in his death. Long after the first edition of this book was published in 1996, I continued to puzzle over the absence of alkaloids in the seeds tested by Clausen and Treadwell. Over a period of several years, I doggedly sifted through the scientific literature, hoping to find a clue that would explain this conundrum. One afternoon, I came across an article titled Identification of Swainsonine as a Probable Contributory Myocotoxin in Moldy Forage Mysotoxicoses. The article described a fungus. Rhizotonia legumicola, which commonly grows as many species of legumes during the summer months in soggy climates. And R. leguminicola, it turns out, is a variety of mold that produces a potent alkaloid called swainsonine, a compound well known to ranchers and veterinarians as a killer of livestock. The literature of veterinary medicine is rife with cases of animals stricken by swainsonine poisoning after eating damp forage contaminated with R. leguminicola. Upon reading further about the connection between R. leguminicola and swainsonine, I had an epiphany. It wasn't the seeds of the wild potato that had done McCandless in. He was probably killed instead by mold that had been growing on those seeds. The dried seeds I'd sent to Clausen and Treadwell had tested negative because they weren't moldy. But there was ample reason to suspect the seeds on which McCandless dined during the last two weeks of July may have been contaminated with R. leguminicola. He had begun to gather and eat large quantities of wild potato seeds on July 14th during an extended period of rainy weather. Between meals, he stored these green seed pods in damp, unclean Ziploc bags, an excellent culture for the proliferation of mold. If the wild potato seeds McCandless ate were contaminated with swainsonine from an eruption of R. leguminicola, it means the guy wasn't quite as reckless or incompetent as he has been made out to be. It means he didn't carelessly confuse one species with another. The plant that poisoned him wasn't toxic per se. McCandless simply had the misfortune to eat moldy seeds. An innocent mistake, it was nevertheless sufficient to end his life. The literature of veterinary medicine does not lack for cases of animals felled by swainsonine poisoning after grazing on forage contaminated with R. leguminicola. The most obvious symptoms of swainsonine poisoning are neurological. According to the paper published in the Journal of the American Veterinary Medicine Association, livestock that have ingested swainsonine show signs of depression, a slow, staggering gait, rough coat, dull eyes with a staring look, emaciation, muscular incoordination, and nervousness, especially when stressed. In addition, affected animals may become solitary and hard to handle and may have difficulty eating and drinking. The effects of swainsonine poisoning are chronic. The alkaloid rarely kills outright. The toxin does the deed insidiously, indirectly, by inhabiting an enzyme essential to glycoprotein metabolism. It creates a massive vapor lock, as it were, in mammalin fuel lines. The body is prevented from turning what it eats into a source of usable energy. If you ingest too much swainsonine, you are bound to starve no matter how much food you put into your stomach. Animals will sometimes recover from swainsonine poisoning after they stop eating contaminated forage, but only if they are in fairly robust condition to begin with. In order for the toxic compound to be excreted in the urine, it first has to bind with available molecules of glucose or amino acid. A large store of proteins and sugars must be present to mop up the poison and wring it from the body. The problem, says Professor Bryant, is that if you're lean and hungry to begin with, you're obviously not going to have any glucose and protein to spare, so there's no way to flush the toxin from your system. When a starving mammal ingests an alkaloid, even one as benign as caffeine, it's going to get hit much harder by it than normally would because the lack of glucose reserves necessary to excrete the stuff. The alkaloid is simply going to accumulate in the system.
If McCandless ate a big slug of these seeds while he was already in a semi-starving condition, it would have been a setup for catastrophe. Laid low by the moldy seeds, McCandless discovered that he was suddenly far too weak to hike out and save himself. He was now too weak even to hunt effectively, and thus grew weaker still, sliding closer and closer towards starvation. His life was spiraling toward the brink with awful speed. There are no journal entries for July 31st or August 1st. On August 2nd, the diary says only, Terrible wind. Autumn was just around the corner, the temperature was dropping, and the days were becoming noticeably shorter. Each rotation of the earth held seven fewer minutes of daylight and seven more of cold and darkness. In the span of a single week, the night grew nearly an hour longer. Day 100, made it, he noted jubilantly on August 5th, proud of achieving such a significant milestone. But in weakest condition of life, death looms as serious threat, too weak to walk out, have literally become trapped in the wild, no game. If McCandless had possessed a U.S. Geological Survey topographic map, map, it would have alerted him to the existence of a Park Service cabin on the upper Shoshana River, six miles due south of the bus, a distance he might have been able to cover even in his severely weakened state. The cabin, just inside the boundary of Denali National Park, had been stocked with a small amount of emergency food, bedding, and first aid supplies for the use of backcountry rangers on their winter patrols. And although they aren't marked on the map, two miles even closer to the bus are a pair of private cabins, one owned by the well-known Healy dog mushers, Will and Linda Forsberg, the other by an employee of Denali National Park, Steve Carwile, where there should have been some food as well. McCandless's apparent salvation, in other words, seemed to be only a three-hour walk upriver. This sad irony was widely noted in the aftermath of his death, but even if he had known about these cabins, they wouldn't have delivered McCandless from harm. At some point at, after mid-April, when the last of the cabins were vacated as the spring thaw made dog mushing and snow machine travel problematic, somebody broke into all three cabins and vandalized them extensively. The food inside was exposed to animals and the weather, ruining it. The damage wasn't discovered until late July, when a wildlife biologist named Paul Atkinson made the grueling 10-mile bushwhack over the outer range from the road into Denali National Park to the Park Service shelter. He was shocked and baffled by the mindless destruction that greeted him. It was obviously not the work of a bear, Atkinson reports. I'm a bear technician, so I know what bear damage looks like. This looked like somebody had gone at the cabins with a claw hammer and bashed everything in sight. From the size of the fireweed growing up through the mattresses that had been tossed outside, it was clear that the vandalism had occurred many weeks earlier. It was completely trashed, Will Forsberg says of his cabin. Everything that wasn't nailed down had been wrecked. All the lamps were broken and most of the windows. The bedding and mattresses had been pulled outside and thrown in a heap, ceiling boards yanked down, fuel cans were punctured, the wood stove was removed, even a big carpet had been hauled out to rot, and all the food was gone. So the cabins wouldn't have helped Alex much, even if he had found them. Or, then again, maybe he did. Forsberg considers McCandless the prime suspect. He believes McCandless blundered upon the cabins after arriving at the bus during the first week of May, flew into a rage over the intrusion of civilization on his precious wilderness experience, and systematically wrecked the buildings. This theory fails to explain, however, while McCandless didn't then also trash the bus. Carwile also suspects McCandless. It's just intuition, he explains. But I get the feeling he was the kind of guy who might want to set the wilderness free. Destroying the cabins would be a way of doing that. Or maybe it was his intense dislike of the government. He saw the sign on the Park Service cabin identifying it as such, assumed all three cabins were government property, and decided to strike a blow against Big Brother. That certainly seems within the realm of possibility. The authorities, for their part, don't think McCandless was the vandal. 
We really hit a blank on who might have done it, says Ken Kerr, chief ranger for Denali National Park. But Chris McCandless isn't considered a suspect by the National Park Service. In fact, there is nothing in McCandless's journal or photographs to suggest he went anywhere near the cabins. When McCandless ventured beyond the bus in early May, his pictures show that he headed north, downstream along the Shoshana, the opposite direction of the cabins. And even if he had somehow chanced upon them, it's difficult to imagine him destroying the buildings without boasting of the deed in his diary. There are no entries in McCandless's journal for August 6th, 7th, or 8th. On August 9th, he notes that he shot at a bear but missed. On August 10th, he saw a caribou but didn't get a shot off, and he killed five squirrels. If a sufficient amount of swainsonide had accumulated in his body, however, this windfall of small game would have provided little nourishment. On August 11th, he killed and ate a ptarmigan. On August 12th, he dragged himself out of the bus to forage for berries after posting a plea for assistance in the unlikely event that somebody would stop by while he was away. Written in meticulous block letters on a page torn from Gogol's Terrace Bulba, it reads, SOS, I need your help. I am injured, near death, and too weak to hike out of here. I am all alone. This is no joke. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I am out collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you. He signed the note, Chris McCandless, August, question mark. Recognizing the gravity of his predicament, he had abandoned the cocky monitor he'd been using for years. Alexander Supertramp in favor of the name given to him at birth by his parents. Many Alaskans have wondered why, in his desperation, McCandless didn't start a forest fire at this point as a distress signal. There were nearly two full gallons of stove gas in the bus. Presumably, it would have been a simple matter to start a conflagration large enough to attract the attention of passing airplanes, or at least burn a giant SOS into the muskeg. Contrary to common belief, however, the bus doesn't lie beneath any established flight path, and very few planes fly over it. Over the four days I spent on the Stampede Trail, I didn't see a single aircraft overhead, other than commercial jets flying at altitudes greater than 25,000 feet. Small planes